Let be asymptomatic, right, by and large, but in males for sure, right, there'll be something, yeah. So those are kind of specific. So if I see any of those specific things, then automatically I'm thinking, yeah, I know where. Yeah, I want to identify, first of all, which axis am I dealing with? Is the, uh, which hormone, if the axis has multiple hormones, and then is, is the hormone high or low? That's your first step. So with that alone, I can narrow down my options, right, significantly. So anything that is unrelated, right, to that axis. Yeah. So that's the key with endocrine. Then another key is I need to be able to, I can tell you, why did they give us labs in endocrine? Why do we, why having those axes and knowing, okay, ACTH, CRH, ACTH, blah, 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 axes, and sometimes they give you the ax, the hormones and tell you which one is high, right? Or low or normal and stuff. It's also to help me narrow it down to the level of the pathology. So I've recognized the pathology from the presentation. I know, okay, the axes I'm dealing with, I know specifically which hormone likely, and I know is it high or low, correct? The next question I need to answer is where is the level of the pathology? So I know the axis, but the axis, each axis have multiple levels. Is it central, is it peripheral? Is that level of the hypothalamus, pituitary, or the gland itself? How can they give you that information? So also, so like we have for the primary and secondary adrenal sufficiency, right? You mentioned the hyperpigmentation. You can look for that feature to determine the level. Or the examiner can give you the labs. If I'm dealing with hormone excess, which means that I expect, right, most of uh, the, at least the primary hormone, the organ, the endogram hormone to be elevated. If the central hormones are also elevated, as well as the hand organ hormone, then it's definitely what it is central. The reason the endogram is making too much hormone, right, is because of stimulation, right, from the hypothalamus of pituitary gland. For instance, a patient has hypercortisolism, and you check the, the axis hormones, CRH is high, ACTH is high, cortisol is high. It is central. The person is where the hypothalamus because everything is high. Makes sense. If the problem is from the pituitary gland, for instance, only the pituitary and the adrenal gland hormone will be high. What happens to say it's going to be low because of suppression. If it's primary, then only cortisol will be high, the others will be low. That is okay. The problem is at the adrenal gland. Same thing, if it's deficiency, everything from the level of the pathology down will be low. Any right. So if the if all of them are low, then the hypothalamus. So my problem is if only the ACTH and cortisol is low, then it's likely pituitary. If only if cortisol is low, the others are high, then definitely adrenal gland, primary, right? So nowhere. Which axis, which hormone, is the hormone high or low? Then, next question will be, which lower is the level, which level in the axis, right, is the pathology, right? That's what we want to do for each axis. That's the point of endocrine system at this level. The others are just minute details. So, we'll go to thyroid axis, and in the thyroid axis too, my, okay, so we know from the times all the TRH, from TRH, TSH, TSH towards thyroid hormone, right? T4, T4, I'm going to T3 in the periphery. What will I see in thyroid excess, hormone excess, that I won't see in any other hormone excess? What specific? Thyroid hormone excess. What we see? Thyroid hormone excess. First, anything that has to do with what? Eat or, or temperature intolerance. It's almost like specific for thyroid hormone. Yes. So if thyroid hormone is high, a patient has what? Eat intolerance. If thyroid hormone is high, although this is not specific for thyroid hormone, you can also see like adrenal insufficiency. But 
so insufficiency but weight loss without eating appetite could also suggest thyroid right hormone excess but they may eat intolerance almost kind of specific but thyroid problem thyroid excess eat intolerance can tolerate hot weather it causes what hyperreflexia <laughs> I don't know what we cause hyperreflexia. It's going to change the reflexes. Hyperreflexia will be there. It's almost something you've never seen any other kind of hormone excess deficiency. Yeah. Bradycardia. Yes. Or tachy Bradycardia hypothyroidism. Tachycardia or tachyarrhythmia hypothyroidism. Well, so it's not specific for hypothyroidism though. If somebody has adrenal insufficiency too, because of their potential, right? It will be tachycardia. But remember, we're looking at constellation of those specific things. It's not just one specific feature. So I'm looking at eating tolerance. Where is losing weight without changing appetite? There's tachyarrhythmia. I'll show you the one set. There's hyperreflexia or pendulum reflex. I mean hyperthyroidism immediately. Make sense? <laughs> it's not specific. It's not specific. It's Pitting edema can help you determine what type, what is the cause, but it is not like a specific feature of hyperthyroidism. Now, you might also see another point. Patient, what if I give somebody with heart failure and hyperthyroidism? Try. Would they have pitting edema from heart failure? Yes, they can. So it's not specific. Right? You get it? Yeah. So as I said, well, hyperthyroidism, my next goal will be, okay, the cause. And to determine the cause, I need to know the level, right, of the pathology. Where is the pathology? Because we have so many levels. We have at least three levels, right? For thyroid hormone two, thyroid axis. So same thing, mm -hmm. clues include, they give me the labs. Give me thyroid, TSH, thyroid hormone. Definitely TSH and thyroid hormone levels. And I want to use that to determine where is the problem. So if I'm dealing with excess, if all the hormones in the axis are high, it is hypothalamus <laughs> where the problem is. If the only TSH and thyroid hormones are high, CRH is low, then I know it's probably from the pituitary gland. If the only thyroid hormones are high, the other hormones are low, it's definitely the level of the word thyroid gland, right? So when I know that, okay, this is primary hyperthyroidism, I can now further differentiate between what? Graves and the other causes <laughs> of hyperthyroidism. What we now see in graves that you won't see in any other cause of hyperthyroidism? <laughs> Exothermus, acropathy, the bones come expanding the hands, and then edema. You can also the pretibia, right? So I see hyperthyroidism and I see those features. I know it's definitely graves. If I say hyperthyroidism and I don't see those features, it's not graves. Something else. Then that's where they cannot they can give you other tests like what radioactive, right? I did uptake. So I see just a nodular uptake, it's just a toxic nod nodule, right? Or adenoma. Oh, I see diffuse uptake, likely graves, Every, the whole gland is functioning. Oh, the gland is cold, it's not taking up anything, it's some sort of thyroiditis. The gland has been destroyed. If it's tender, subacute, non tender, silent, right? Make sense? Yeah. If the gland is atrophic, the puppet, you can't even puppet the gland at all. Patient has a the gland is completely atrophic. You know, it looks so the, the lab shows is primary. Test a thyroid hormones high, TSH uh, CRH low, but the puppet gland is atrophic. Doesn't make any sense. If the gland is functioning, it should can it should either be normal size or enlarged. Makes sense. So if it's atrophy, it means patient is taking thyroid hormone from the outside. 
exogenous. Got that, right? Yeah. yeah. And if I'm dealing with hypothyroidism, right, what, what specific features do I see to say, okay, this is hypothyroidism, opposite of what we talked about, now patients will have cold intolerance. They are gaining weight without what, changing appetite, right? Bradycardia. What else reflex? Hyporeflexia, right? Sometimes you might also say myopathy, actually both hyper and hypothyroid, although myopathy is not specific. It can definitely affect cause muscle weakness itself. Proximal myopathy, although it's not specific, you can say that in hyperconsolism too. Yeah, but you know, constellation, you can think as a big picture, not just one thing. Yeah. So I think, okay, thyroid deficiency. Next question, where's the level? <laughs> right. I'm going to give you the O labs. Or another clue I can give you to tell you uh, another thing I can tell you actually if the cause of hypothyroidism is from is central, since the pituitary gland and hypothalamus make or control multiple glands, if I'm seeing mixtures, <laughs> do you get what I mean? Multiple endocrinopathies. Imagine seeing both adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism together. Or I'm seeing hypothyroidism together with hypogonadism is likely going to be central because they are the only glands that control multiple right glands but if it's isolated there's likely what just something affecting the primary right gland most likely although still let the labs guide you or confirm yeah based on what he's saying then i narrow down to the level and then i can come with my differentials of the cancer based on that yeah and you can do that also for the gonadal axis. Same principle. What will I see in gonadal axis problem that we see anywhere? Okay, so we think hypogonadism, of course, erectile dysfunction, decreased libido, etc. You see that. Oh, if it's uh, females, also osteoporosis, vaginal dryness, right? etc. Um, then if it's and, uh, and, uh, ax, uh, excess, uh, mostly men with too much testosterone, they probably won't, they're going to be asymptomatic. Yeah, um, females are ever with too much, right, and estrogen also depends on, okay, okay too much testosterone, pre-puberty, precocious puberty. After puberty, might be asymptomatic. Pre-puberty for females, hyper gonadism, yeah, precocious puberty also. After puberty, reproductive age female, you wouldn't know, or they may have non-specific pregnancy-like, right, symptoms. Because of estrogen, right? Being high in pregnancy can mimic like breasts will be tender and enlarged. Yeah, things like that. They may have that. But post puberty postmenopausal women, unless it's estrogen now, they're gonna have an abnormal uterine bleeding. <laughs> right. That would be the only clue you're gonna have. Okay, okay, estrogen is high somewhat. So those are specifics for that axis. And once I know, okay, high, low, whatever, next question, where is the level, right? Where is the problem? Central or peripheral? Is it a gland itself, like cancer, tumor, or is it central? And don't all forget, when you're thinking of gonadal axis and you're thinking peripheral, you're not only thinking of the gonads, you're also thinking of the adrenal cortex, because adrenal cortex also makes androgens. Make sense? Yeah. So if I'm doing with androgen excess and my lab show general rate is low, energy research is low, but the testosterone estrogen is high. Now I'm thinking it's peripheral, correct? Your differential now will be either the gonad, ovaries or testes, there's a tumor there, something's some going on there, or it may be adrenal cortical, right? Tumor or congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Because the adrenal glands can make androgens. So question is how do you not tell them apart? Now you're looking for what DHEA, right? Sulfate, right? Adrenal gland is the only one that makes the DHEA sulfate. The gonads do not. So if I see primary hypergonadism, androgens are high, DHEA sulfate is normal or low, it's gon it's the gonad as a source. If I see DHEA sulfate is also high, it's the adrenal cortex as a source. So that specifics 
these are you organize so when you organize things like that in your mind when you're going to questions you have a purpose like you're going to them purposefully i'm not just reading to see what comes up i know exactly what i'm thinking about i know how i should approach it i know i have a stepwise right approach in my mind okay where is the which is defect, uh, defective is the excess of deficiency then location which level then that will always guide me to the correct answer, right? No matter what. You get it? Yeah. Right. Prolactin access. Okay. And uh, prolactin access to uh, prolactin. Yeah. Interesting. Like you mentioned, dopamine controls it, right? Yeah. So drugs that will inhibit dopamine, right, can cause hyperprolactinemia. And prolact. What's the link between prolactin and gonadal access? <laughs> So what is the link between prolactin and gonadal? The gonadal axis, generated the capacity. What's the link? So prolactin in the beach, right? Generate. And LH message goes down, it is so it's, it's called central, right? Hypogonadism. So prolactin does. That's why patients with hyperplatinemia, right? They have what? Hypogonadism. They can be infertile. Menstrual irregularities. Yeah? Things like that. What about, what is the link between Okay. So, yeah, so thyroid, right? Thyroid, right? It's linked between, like you mentioned, thyroid and um, prolactin, right? TRH, correct? TRH stimulates prolactin. Which explains why people with thyroid disorders can have what? Gonadal issues, right? Like features of hypogonadism or menstrual irregularities. Somebody has primary hypogonadism and hypothyroidism. TRH is high. Prolactin will be high. Prolactin will suppress, right? The gonadal axis. Yeah. Why is the um, right? Why does weight loss, significant weight loss, like in patients with eating disorders, right? Why does that cause the hypogonadism? Okay, what right? So why how is generating in that case? Okay, okay. Okay, so patient loses weight, right? So what is the link between weight loss and the generator axis? The link is leptin. That's the link. They don't, they don't have a mutation leptin gene. What happens is adipose, what happens to loss of, when, what, what makes leptin? Adipose, adiposite. Patient loses weight and the adipocyte uh, levels or adipose tissue mass goes down. What happens to leptin levels? Leptin will be low. Leptin normally stimulates generate. That's what leptin does. It can stimulate generate. So if leptin goes down, generate is low. LHFS is low, right? Estrogen low. That's why patients with senior weight loss, they can become amenorrheic. Amenorrhea and the right osteoporosis it is a, yeah. Make sense? Yeah. That link is super important.
So all those links there, those interaxis links, that's we want to know them and remember them. They love testing those a lot. Regulation of the axis, how are they linked together? Also, growth hormone. How do you regulate growth hormone? Glucose plays a role, right? In growth hormone regulation, hypoglycemia increases, right? GRH, uh, growth hormone releasing hormone, which will in turn really increase, right? Growth hormone, which will in increase what? Well, insulin growth factor, right? Yeah, made by the liver. While hyperglycemia will do the opposite, right? Suppress the axis, growth hormone axis. Why do you think hypoglycemia increases growth hormone? What role does growth hormone play in hypoglycemia? Yeah. Yeah, so why do I want to, why do I want to high growth hormone when glucose level is low? It doesn't right. If if uh, if anything, sooner I will want high growth hormone when glucose is high, when I have enough energy. So why is it high when glucose is low? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because if I don't have glucose, how will I increase muscle mass? How will I grow? Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right. So in that case, the reason growth hormone goes up in hypoglycemia is to increase insulin resistance. So the idea is this, and it only goes high, right, in severe hypoglycemia. Because when glucose is low, what do you want to do? We want to leave glucose, right, to the cells that cannot use any other source of energy or than glucose. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what we want to do. Now, so what can we do is what? Prevent cells that can use other sorts of glucose, right? Prevent them from using glucose. So I can leave glucose for like red blood cells, right? And also neurons that prefer glucose. So we want to, so growth hormone does what? Growth hormone increases insulin resistance. That's what it does. When glucose is too low and growth hormone is high, growth hormone is going to increase insulin resistance well, in skeletal muscles, in muscles. So that muscles will stop taking up glucose, right? And start using what? Ketones and lipids, fatty acids, source of energy. And we leave the glucose for what? Neurons and red blood cells. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. And then, I mean, also like arginine. Arginine can stimulate growth hormone because arginine, why? Right. Yes. Yes. So the question is why? Mm -hmm. Why should growth hormone be high when arginine is high? What do you think? In the muscles, okay. So why is that gene particularly important? Why is it important? What role does it play in growth? Talk the body is under DNA structure and DNA packaging. Why is that gene important? A gene is the major component of what is stones. So how do cells grow? They proliferate, isn't it? By hyperplasia and hypertrophy, that's how cells grow. So which means during active growth, cells that are proliferating will be making what is stones and they require massive amount of arginine to do that. So arginine goes up in the body, in the blood, rightfully stimulates growth hormone axis. So that what growth hormone can stimulate growth of tissue, which makes sense. But now I have raw material to grow, right? Let's grow. There's arginine, abundant arginine, let the cells proliferate. Yeah. And when arginine is low, I don't have the raw material to grow. Then I will suppress growth hormone, right? Prevent growth, <laughs> right? Make sense? Yes. Uh -huh. So yeah, one of the another reason you want to know all those like what stimulates this, what suppresses this, right? Is in endocrine system, when you suspect and, and this is going to be applied more to clinical medicine, but the principle can be tested in basic science. In endocrine system, when you suspect there's something wrong with an um, uh, with a with a particular hormone, 
either on money is high or low. We need to get a biochemical confirmation first before we do imaging. Which, if you think about it, it makes sense. Because I need to know the level, all right, where the problem is, as well as confirm if this is a true deficiency, right, or excess, before I now do my, either know if I want to do a brain CT or MRI or do I need to look at the primary organ, yeah, to know where the problem, confirm the pathology. So here's the general rule. There are some exceptions, but the general rule is this. In the endocrine system, when there's excess hormone production, you usually do what? You do a suppression test. You do a biochemical suppression test. So if someone is presenting features of excess hormone, how do we confirm that what this excess hormone is actually is true? It's true excess, not pseudo excess. Because sometimes the gland can physiologically, right, have produced hormone in excess, but actually they don't have a pathology like a tumor. Yeah. So we, we can confirm that by doing what? A suppression test. So suppress the axis. And see if the hormone goes down. If the hormone goes down on suppression, then it's just physiological excess, it's not pathology. We're done. But if the hormone remains high, then something is causing the excess, like a tumor. Then if you suspect there's a deficiency, what do you do? You usually do a stimulation test. If the deficiency is physiologic, let's say the hormone is slightly low because of physiologic problem, then if I do a stimulation test, the axis will stimulated right physiologically and the hormone will go back up but if the deficiency is true deficiency pathology you do a simulation test what happens to the axis there's nothing nothing will change the hormone will still be low after stimulation example i suspect the patient has um uh, 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 thyroid hormone axis deficiency maybe it's very central I can do what TSH stimulation test. Give the patient TSH and see what happens to the thyroid hormone level. Thyroid hormone level becomes elevated. Definitely tell me it's central. Something is wrong. The gland is fine. Thyroid hormone levels remain low. Then it's primary. Something's wrong with the gland itself. Oh, and you know, the same principle applies to ACT stimulation test. Is it adrenal gland or is it central? Yeah. So that right. So that, that those are the principle behind like stimulation or suppression test. You want to confirm if it's true excess. Sometimes is it true deficiency, and also it also allow you to narrow down the level of the deficiency or excess. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. So that's the high yield axis right? that like hypothalamus. Endogen axis, but then which other endocrine glands are which other endocrine glands are not under the control of hypothalamus and pituitary gland? At least not directly. Which other endocrine glands are not directly under the control of the hypothalamus and pituitary glands? Mm -hmm. mm? Thyroid. So what controls per thyroid gland? Nice, so what controls it? What does Pata gland do? So what controls Pata gland? Calcium or phosphate controls Pata gland. Like, yeah. So Pata gland makes Pata hormone. Alright, so what controls the gland? What controls the hormone level? Is the calcium or phosphate? Like normally, right, affect. It's like a feedback loop, right? Inhibition or something like that. For calcium, pH is going to be the stimulation. pH, uh, phosphate, rather. Right? But those are things that are controlled by the gland, right? So it's not under, it's not like a releasing of hormone or anything. Yeah, it's, but it's controlled by the calcium and phosphate itself. Serum, calcium and phosphate levels control pH. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay.
<laughs> yeah, like just independent by itself. Yeah, and then only control calcium or phosphate. All right, so which other endocrine gland is not controlled by hypothalamus? I'm pretty sure. The pancreas, right? Pancreas is uh, autonomous, almost, well, not autonomous, that's its control, but not by the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, right? Directly. Yeah. So the endocrine pancreas, what is the function of the endocrine pancreas? What is function? Okay. So endocrine pancreas primarily controls what well, glucose levels, right? Yeah, maintains glucose homeostasis through which hormones. And look at going, which cells make insulin? And glucagon is made by what do delta cells make? Somatostatia. So, what effect does insulin normally have on glucose? Okay. How? Okay. Okay. So that inverted when the beta cells, and that's how they release insulin, right? Yeah. So the question is, what does insulin do? How does it lower serum glucose? So it can increase uptake of glucose, right? I mean, yeah. So I, I'm getting glucose into the cells, get it out of the blood. All right. How will I get glucose into the cells, right? Well, not only do I need transporters to get it into the cell, I also need to turn on the pathways that use glucose. Like if I if I get into the cell but there's no pathway to use it, the glucose will leave. It's gonna get back into the blood. I need a way to trap it in the cell, convert it to other forms, right? For storage or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, and that's what insulin does. Insulin gets it into cells, and which cells does it get it into primarily? Typically, skeletal muscles, right, and adipocytes, they are the ones that have what, insulin dependent transporters, GLUT4. Although other cells also have insulin independent. So every cell in the body can try to take up glucose. 
But some take up glucose more when insulin is high. Make sense? Yeah. For cells that can take up glucose even when insulin is low, the problem is if they are taking up glucose but insulin is not there to turn on the pathways that use glucose, right? Eventually, glucose will stop entering at some point. Yeah. So that's why even though the liver does not need insulin to take up glucose because it has a GLU2 transporter, like the beta cells also have GLU2, they can take up glucose when glucose is high in the blood. But if insulin is not there to turn on the pathways that allow the liver to convert glucose to glycogen, break it down in glycolysis, right? What happens? Eventually, glucose will accumulate and start leaking back out in the blood. Make sense? Yeah. Good. So, that's what insulin does. And then that will lower, right? Serum glucose. Either way. Glucagon does the opposite. So those parts of the insulin we turn on glucagon, we turn them off, <laughs> right? And then turn on parts that actually make glucose, right? Gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis. So depending, on, exactly. So depending on what the glucose level is in the blood, that regulation is so amazing. Right? Yeah, it just makes a lot of sense. So I just need to know. Okay, these are the things that we get glucose out of the blood. Oh, GLUT4 activation, uh, turning on glycolysis, uh, turning on glycogenolysis, right, uh, fatty acid synthesis, all those anabolic pathways, they get glucose out, most of them, except ketogenesis, get glucose out of the blood, lower serum glucose. Then I to, on the other hand, what are the parts that actually increase serum glucose, right? Opposite. Uh, I've shut off all those ones that bring it down, and then I turn on things that will increase it. So glycogenolysis, breakdown glycogen, gluconeogenesis, synthesizing new glucose, fatty acid breakdown to provide energy. Fatty acid was able to provide energy, right? Catabolic passes mostly they increase by right? some glucose, yeah. Then once I know that, now I will not talk about regulation. So the or insulin we turn on, those pathways that will bring it down, bring serum glucose down, and turn off those pathways that had glucose to the blood. Glucagon would do the opposite. Glucagon, epinephrine, cortisol, growth hormone. They do the opposite. They turn off those parts that will take glucose out and turn on those parts that will get glucose back into the blood. Right. All I need to know, so how will I know which ones will be active when under physiology condition? I just need to know the state the patient is in. Patient in the fed state or fasting or starvation phase. Somebody is in fed state where glucose is high in the blood, I expect the ones that will get it out, right, to be active. Because that's why insulin will be high. If a patient is in the fasting or starvation phase, I expect the ones that will get it back into the blood right, to be high, right? Because at that point, insulin will be low, glucagon, epinephrine, glucagon, will be cut, so will be high. Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> What's will be first? Right, because now glucose is low in the blood, right? So you want to get it maintain normal glucose. So you have to turn on pathways that will get it get glucose into the blood. Right? Which one is activated first? Glycogen is activated first and glycogen is depleted, right? Within like 12 hours, 12 to 24 hours. So by, by 24 hours, glycogen lysis doesn't contribute much anymore, right? It's not going to be glucose, right? Just it's going to take over, yeah. So timeline we tell me which one is active, right? <clears throat> yeah, at that point. Mm -hmm. But that that's basically that's what we that's glucose, that's how we control glucose level. So what what's wrong with diabetic people patients? For some reason the pathways mm -hmm. that take glucose out they're not working. And the pathways that actually have glucose, right? They're working too much. 
there's an imbalance. Why is there an imbalance? Either the patient is not making insulin at all. Type 1, right? There's destruction of beta cells. Insulin deficiency. Or there's insulin resistance. They're making insulin, but receptors are not responding as they should. So either way, the pathways that get glucose out of the blood are not going to be working as they should. The ones that get glucose in will be working too much. So imbalance. The balance is tilted towards the word, the production side. Yeah. And patient become diabetic. Sustained hyperglycemia. Too much glucose, too little glucose is bad. Too much glucose is equally bad. Right. So we need everything should be in moderation. Yeah. So and that's that's basically right. That is but by this level we wanna know, right? Just the the biochemical basis. That that's what we wanna know about diabetes and also understand why they have the condition they have, why they develop microvascular complications, why they develop macrovascular complications. Neuropathy, retinopathy, nephropathy, what's the basis behind that? We gotta know that. Why do they develop cataracts? Why, right? Why do they have polyuria? Polydipsia? We gotta know. That's what you need to be tested on at this level. And then we 